Welcome to a special out of band episode of The Adventures of Alice and Bob. In a twist to our usual format, we're going to be digging into the recent Okta incident and the team effort that led to a discovery by Beyond Trust that Okta's support unit had been compromised and a threat actor had been able to gain access to sensitive client data impacting multiple customers. In order to shine some light on these recent events, I'm joined today by Beyond Trust CTO Mark Mayfrey to dive into the incident that sparked this discovery, discuss the investigation and the process that led to a public acknowledgement by Okta, and find out what can be better done to protect Okta accounts and defend against identity security threats in general. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, dude. I know it's been a really busy few weeks for you, and I appreciate you jumping on with us today to talk about this. So let's dive straight in at the start. Where did this incident all begin for you? Yeah, so it was really on the, the October 2nd. Um, we had uh, both some in-house alerting in our own uh, Identity Security Insights uh, product that detected uh, the potential uh, uh, attacks happening to one of our Okta admin accounts. And so obviously the, the Beyond Trust security teams and also our research team got involved to look at it uh, try to figure out, you know, what, what was the extent, what was going on. Um, it was obviously caught caught very quick, uh, given the alerts that we had, and so we were able to shut it down very fast. But the the immediate question began of, uh, like like in most incident things like this, is uh, well, what what was the origin, right? Like, how was somebody able to uh, essentially, uh, you know, commandeer uh, this this uh, uh, Octa administrator uh, account in the first place? And so you've seen that that information flashing up on the dashboards, you know that an account has been accessed there. What were the first stages? What what things were you initially looking into and thinking about? I mean, I'm assuming we didn't go straight to Okta Compromise and we started somewhere else with it. Yeah, I mean, when we first looked, you know, one of the, one of the first things we saw that when we were going over the logs was um, the identity that uh, uh, was leveraged. Uh, there was no actual sign-in event uh, for some behavior that we uh, triggered on that was uh, originating out of Malaysia. And so that pretty quickly uh, led us to start to think that this is some sort of uh, session hijacking. And so obviously when you're, when you're dealing with something like session hijacking, it, it can you know, come from uh, or it can happen a few different ways. But you know, one of the things you always want to be concerned about is that you know, is there a, a system in your environment uh, where this, you know, uh, this uh, legitimate account is being used uh, and that system has been compromised and you know, some sort of a cookie or session token, et cetera, has been stolen from that individual user system. So that was the very first thing that we started to look at just to make sure there was no kind of uh, further extent of what was going on. And, you know, we quickly found that uh, there was nothing related to our systems. And so then there was this immediate mystery of, okay, what's what's plausible of how a session's hijacked when it's like, um, without getting into specifics, when we're like, you know, pretty, pretty positive it's not... <laughs> Uh, from one of our systems itself being breached, and so that started the uh, the big uh, racking our brains on potential, uh, you know, how this could take place. With one of those uh, uh, plausible uh, ideas, you know, being that Okta themselves have been compromised. And what was the the link that made you think this was Okta? I believe it is this admin user had been working a support ticket with Okta. So what were the kind of the timelines there, and how did that lead you down that path? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. So when we first started looking at it, um, you know, realizing it was uh, this sort of session hijacking, uh, understanding that it wasn't kind of going to be related to our systems based on some things we were able to look at. So we quickly obviously started both talking to the user and doing uh, forensics related to the user's systems. And <clears throat> that's when we uh, uh, realized talking to the user that based on the timeline that we had been building, uh, that they had been working on an ongoing uh, support case, nothing security related, but an ongoing just product troubleshooting case with Okta. And uh, about 30 minutes uh, before the session hijacking, they had uploaded uh, a browser recording to the actual HAR file, uh, to the actual uh, Okta support uh, portal. Uh, and so it was pretty much at that point, Occam's razor, that uh, uh, it was either highly coincidental that some of these, you know, on one of these systems and just decided to, you know, steal a session at that, that kind of uh, same 30 minute window, uh, or more likely, um, and, and what we believe then, uh, was that Okta uh, at some level in their support organization was compromised. And how did that then play out in terms of engaging with Okta and actually determining whether it, that was indeed the case? Yeah. So we, I mean, we escalated it pretty immediately. So on the, the original, on the, on the second, 
uh, we had already started making inquiries to their support team. Uh, you know, that there might be something amiss that they should be looking at. And uh, on the third, um, you know, being even more confident that there was some sort of compromise uh, within Okta support. On the third, we were um, asking support, you know, please escalate to your, your InfoSec team and, you know, offering for us to get on on the phone with them as soon as we could. Because at that point, the worry was was nothing to do with, with our company. We found it immediately, prevented it from doing anything uh, of harm. And uh, I was much more worried as the entire team was as far as uh, uh, the potential that Okta uh, other customers are being affected, that this isn't just something specific to us if they have kind of, you know, compromised Okta support. And uh, obviously given some things in the past with a different type of support compromise there, you know, we were very worried of like um, what other customers uh, of Octas might be impacted. So on the third was kind of our initial, um, you know, raising it, trying to get this, the security team involved, get ourselves personally speaking to them uh, versus kind of uh, relayed through support. And um, we, we did eventually make uh, uh, make contact, uh, but on the uh, uh, it took took some time uh, to kind of get it escalated, right? So it wasn't until uh, October 11th, uh, and then again on October 13th, uh, that we were able to get on a couple of Zoom sessions with the uh, security team, and you know essentially walk them through. Here's why we believe you you guys have a compromise. Um, you know, trying to as strongly as possible say you guys should be turning over every every stone possible um because it didn't didn't feel like in the 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 early days at least it felt like you know maybe there was more of a belief that it was something on on our end right that there wasn't something happening you know um you know within octa support that could have kind of led to what happened to us so uh really try to stress it to them on the uh um you know two week kind of period uh to, to investigate and turn over every stone and during that period, you know, were there any discussions around had other customers been impacted? Was this a, a broader issue? Yeah, that was our main thing was, you know, I realized, you know, for all companies, right, when you're either starting or in the middle of like an incident response, you know, there's only so much you want to share when because, you know, you, you need to first and foremost know the extent and kind of clean clean attackers out of your environment potentially and some things like that. Um, but yeah, we had no, no indication until finally on the, the 19th, uh, when we heard from their security leadership that in fact they had a breach, you know, up, up until then there was, you know, n n no, no sense or signs that they kind of, uh, knew anybody was in their, <clears throat> in their systems, you know, and, and, um, just, uh, um, yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> when you look at, when you look at things like this and, and, you know, 20, 20 plus years of doing this, there's, um, there's definitely, um, some some crazy kind of stars aligning type of uh, attacks and things that can happen, but a lot of times it's you know this kind of Occam's razor of like the the obvious thing kind of kind of really is just what is actually happening. And so uh, I remember one of the conversations I think it was on the 11th or 13th. You know, I was telling the security team um, <clears throat> at Okta, I was just like, you know, been doing this a long time. Uh, um, here, here's why we believe it's something you know where you guys are compromised. But if you have any other theory <laughs> as far as what I might be missing that we should be looking at. Cause it, it you know, I think anybody working at security, when you have a, when you have a sense of um, how you think this, um, you know, breach might've taken place. And then it's like two weeks uh, without any confirmation. I mean, to be honest, it started feeling a bit like a crazy person with the team where I'm like, maybe, maybe we're missing something, right? Like maybe this obvious, you know, the support compromise is something different. And um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, uh, um, uh, definitely uh um i don't know the right word maybe not satisfying or anything because it's it's obviously uh not a great thing that they're going through as a company and that customers are going through but uh we, we finally didn't feel crazy anymore on the 19th when, when they let us know uh that, that that this was what was going on and you know stuff that we didn't talk about in the in the blog or anything is um you know i won't get in the uh total details but let's just say we had uh, you know uh, done some interesting stuff related to uh, uh, honeypots and, and lures and other things because we felt like there was a uh, a need uh, to you know um, uh, extra have kind of the uh, the smoking gun type of uh, uh, evidence um, just to make sure that uh, you know it would be acted on so that their customers could be protected. Well, you can't tease the uh, listeners of Alice and Bob with a story about a honeypot and not go into details there, Mark. So. What what was that actually all about? We we need to know some more of the background there. I think. 
F- fair enough, fair enough. So we we didn't mention it in the in the blog because it didn't seem specifically, uh, you know, pertinent to kind of the uh, the timeline as far as what the attacker was trying to do. And most importantly, we wanted to get that information out. But we we got to this point where um, you know trying to uh, escalate stuff within within Octo is just a little worried of um, you know where where are we going to properly get it escalated and things kind of looked looked at. And so what, what we ended up deciding to do was uh, we stood up uh, an entire uh, secondary uh, Okta infrastructure um, uh, it, and with the goal essentially of creating a honeypot, generating a lure uh, to uh, essentially um, uh, get that kind of uh, smoking gun, uh, you know, capture of we upload data to their support por- portal and now it's being used. So h- how we actually went about that was um, from when we asked the Octo support team and security team, we, we essentially wanted logs of uh, any interactions with our our support accounts, uh, uh, any any files downloaded, you know, timestamps, all this. And so when we got the initial logs from uh, uh, Okta, uh, based on some things we knew we had requested from the system, there was like gaps in the logs and the logs didn't, let's just say the logs weren't complete that we were given. And so then we kind of got even more worried of like, we're seeing gaps in the logs. We're not getting it properly escalated. Occam's razor is pointing to this. And so um, we very much felt at that point that we kind of needed, you know, just we're going to really need some hard evidence to like force the issue with them of sorts. And so uh, we set about to essentially stand up a a secondary uh, Okta uh, infrastructure. Um, We uh, uh, did it in a way that, looked completely legitimate to the business. Uh, we set up uh, uh, special proxying and, and logging and, and alerting uh, on this environment. Um, I won't get into some of the specifics of it, um, but uh, uh, once we had this environment set up uh, to look completely legitimate, uh, we actually um, uh, added a variety of uh, uh, admin kind of believable accounts to it. Um, and then we essentially generated uh, another browser uh, har file uh, for this now, you know, kind of honeypot we built over the night uh, for this uh, very believable Okta uh, infrastructure. <laughs> and um, we essentially, uh, uh, within that har file, uh, had it set up where uh, if we get accessed again, you know, once we uploaded it to the Okta support site, uh, if it was hijacked in the way that the uh, kind of previous real thing was. Uh, then we would have a million and one alarms go off, and it, it's always funny, as 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 you know, and and others when you're setting up kind of, you know, honeypot alerting like this. Um, and there's obviously some great tools out there to do that, but in this case, it was it was something we did a a very tailored specific thing with what we set up with Okta. And uh, whenever you're setting stuff like this up, um, you know, you get all the alerting in place, you get it all the, you know, all, all ready to go. And then um, we all of a sudden had uh, got like an initial alert, which was uh, one, one of the folks involved just hadn't kind of logged out themselves yet, right? So it was like a false positive. Um, and then uh, like all fun uh, honeypots, you know, the trap was set and uh, uh, we left it to see uh, what we would end up catching or not. But uh, it was uh, a pretty crazy thing. And, and you know, again, very thankful to the, the team here, uh, both in research and, and security and development to be able to stand up that fake Okta environment extremely quickly. And, and like I said, there's a longer story than we could kind of get into within the uh, uh, the blog there. Um, but it uh, was a very cool thing as far as uh, being able to set up that trap to uh, uh, have more uh, believable information as far as what was being stolen from where. Now I'm going to continue to push my luck here and say, did the, uh, <laughs> did the trap ever get sprung? And are, are there any details you can share there? Well, that that is a story for another time, James. We will be holding you to that um, at some point in the future, I'm sure, uh, on another episode of this podcast. Yeah, story for another time, another co- a conference beer. <laughs> I mean, a slight tangent here, but what would you say to people actually who are in this situation, who are dealing with a vendor and are worried that the vendor's been compromised, they've gathered a body of evidence? How how best should they approach that? Because often you're just dealing with a support desk, and really these things need to be escalated quickly. So. What's your advice for how to go about that? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's a great question. So I, I think two things. You know, I, I definitely, I, you know, I always, always stress to the to the folks on our own team that you know we're we're kind of lucky in a situation like this to to be a security team, uh, to be a security company that you know we essentially build products to detect and prevent identity threats, right? So we're kind of like 
um, not normal in this scenario of both being able to like maybe catch this type of thing, but also being able to like, you know, get a vendor to, uh, to take notice. Right. And so it's much, much harder, right? Like if you are that security person, that's, you know, I know at a, at a manufacturing company or something else, um, you know, some of the things I think about, you know, obviously you want to attempt to escalate how you can, you know, sometimes the best escalation, uh, always deals with, you know, if you're a customer always deals with the, uh, the financials of it. Right. So if you're not getting anywhere with, uh, support, you know, if you have your account rep or anybody else, right. And making sure that, uh, uh, people know that they they might lose lose money, right? Uh, if if you're not escalated, so I mean, it, there, there's no two ways about it that you know it can be uh, very hard. You know, I've seen this for many years. Um, you know, kind of on a similar but different side, where if you're a security researcher finding vulnerabilities and you're not kind of a a known entity and and uh, and so forth, it can be hard sometimes to get you know vendors to take notice, even on on that end. Let alone the you know suggesting to a vendor like you know you have a hunch that they might be breached is, uh, um, you know, a difficult thing, I think, to, uh, uh, to accomplish. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing too is, you know, for, uh, you know, again, companies that are, um, you know, maybe in that sort of situation, you know, beyond kind of account reps and other things is, you know, it's always worthwhile if you have another security company that you're working with that kind of does anything related to, you know, uh, threats or, or, or whatnot, you know, maybe trying to leverage a, a third party, uh, you know, to kind of help advocate for you. And, um, yeah, there's definitely these sort of times and situations that, that come up. I've seen it, you know, n no different than, uh, uh, the loose thread of, um, when myself and, uh, uh, Ryan Perma discovered code red, it was a customer that had sent us a network capture that was like, you know, something weird might be happening. You guys should have a look. Right. And we we're, um, you know, happy enough to kind of pull on that that loose thread and, and see where it went. Right. And it turned into this whole other thing. And I think, you know, situations like this, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, just kind of a diligence that's, that's needed, you know. And it's important to say that Okta have actually been out there and stated that all customers who are impacted by this have been notified. And if you haven't been contact by the, contacted by them, that there's no impact to your environment. However, given, you know, the limited detail and the notifications that have come out, We've seen other, recent other Okta warnings around threat actors targeting super administrator accounts in different ways, not just through their support desk. What are the controls that you would advise organizations to put in place to better protect themselves against a variety of these uh, Okta type attacks? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and um, yeah, definitely uh, uh, to your point, you know, I very much appreciate uh, Okta, their transparency, notifying folks. I mean, there, there's definitely still, you know, I think some questions everybody would love to get answers to, but uh, really appreciate that they they put word out there. And, you know, I, I saw some things out and, uh, um, you know, out online where I guess, you know, um, uh, as, as I joke with somebody, we're in good company with uh, folks like uh, Cloudflare and, and others, right, that, um, you know, let folks know that they were also kind of uh, uh, wrapped up and targeted in this uh, this type of way. And, you know, the reality of like, not just Okta, but like most the kind of the, the overall uh, identity infrastructure uh, that is pretty sprawling these days and is really the basis for most, most people's standards of kind of how they do IT, um, yeah, it, it's extremely complicated. And so just first even trying to get the visibility and the understanding of what is your infrastructure and what's normal in your infrastructure, right? Like if you look at some of the, the uh, recent breaches, right, where they're essentially adding secondary authentication systems to things like Okta and related, right, as a way to bypass and gain access to other user accounts once they have kind of an initial foothold. Um, <clears throat> everything from that to just, you know, the the straight up, you know, session hijacking of, of individual accounts. And uh, there's probably too many uh, uh, configuration slash detection best practices. I would definitely refer people to our blog. I think it's much more exhaustive than me butchering it uh, here, trying to trying to give, but I I will just say that you know it, it's um it's something that a lot of these systems I mean there's a lot of inherent uh, complexity in them and and they're you know at the end of the day it's the uh, the thing that's allowing you uh, into a, a system or not uh, in in many many cases right so it's uh, it's definitely something to be thoughtful of of uh, you know what is your kind of process around securing these types of systems. One particular thing has I've seen coming up in a few few internet threads discussing this where people are talking about well you know it's it's absolutely imp imperative that you protect these key accounts with MFA. But I know you've spoken in the past about there are limitations in different types of MFA, and in fact some of these attack techniques actually are, are quite effective at bypassing MFA entirely. So maybe you could just speak to to that point. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. So, I mean, definitely everywhere as much as possible, you know, leveraging stuff like FIDO2 as like a much, uh, much, much better form of uh, MFA than say like uh, push or, or SMS, um, you know, doing things uh, like uh, what Okta and others have, where you can essentially restrict authentication just to, or especially for your more privileged accounts, restrict it to just uh, manage devices. Uh, there's a variety of those things that are uh, uh, far better. The, the challenge, like you were saying, though, is that even if you're doing something where you restrict authentication to uh, uh, a known managed device, uh, you're, you're doing FIDO2 FIDO to uh, eliminate phishing in that way, um, things like session hijacking are, are still very much a reality, right? It's, it's the difference of uh, does the user end up uh, getting the one wrong piece of code on their system that can you know, essentially hijack their session? Uh, there's a bunch of ways to go about it. Uh, obviously, in the case that we're talking about here, this is something where, you know, sessions being hijacked, you know, because of uh, data, uh, you know, in this case, uh, ad octa that was able to be stolen, right? So um, it, it it really just kind of shows the complexity of all that, you know, people that work in information security, what they're, what they're trying to prevent and do at the end of the day. And uh, I, I think that's the main thing, you know, relevant to, to this, uh, to this podcast, to this episode is that, um, you know, we wanted to share and, and just uh, um, talk a little bit about our experience here. And, you know, definitely for the more technical details, reference the uh, uh, blog. But, you know, I think also it's just a chance to acknowledge all the folks that are dealing with attacks like this all the time, every day, right? And when you're working in security, that just that sense of something's always looming, right? Like something's always waiting to, waiting to drop, right? And so uh, uh, I think we tend to thank uh, the community and many different people on this podcast, but you know, part of it is I just want to get on to thank the team at Beyond Trust, right? And thank the various security teams, thank the various researchers that were involved, um, that you know do their own hard work every day to keep us safe and our customers safe, right? And so, uh, mad shout out and thanks to them. Absolutely, you know, completely agree with that. It's mad shout out a thing. Is that what the kids say these days? I don't. Maybe it is now. They're all going to be saying it after this podcast, Mark. It is now. You've, you've coined it there. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be down with the youth from now on. Um, no, really appreciate the the feedback there and the sentiment. It's it's absolutely key. For the people listening to the podcast who are thinking, I've got an Okta environment, I'm worried about these things now, I need to secure them, I want to understand what the indicators of compromise were, where I can find out more information, where would you point them towards? Yeah, I would, I would start first with uh, go to our blog, read the most recent uh, Okta security blog. We also reference uh, a second blog that we had just published a couple weeks ago that has even more details around Okta security, what you should be thinking about, what you should be doing. Um, definitely if you're um, uh, looking to get a, a free assessment, uh, definitely check out our Identity Security Insights product, which essentially is what we actually used uh, to detect this attack uh, and is uh, essentially focused on identity-based, uh, not just threats, but more important to what you asked, how do you actually uh, get total visibility into your identity estate, understand your misconfigurations, what you should be fixing and improving, right, to kind of reduce your uh, attack surface there. Um, but yeah, I would definitely start with those uh, those places to begin with. Anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up, Mark? No, man. Stay diligent. Stay diligent. <laughs> for everyone. That's all we have time for on this special Out of Band episode. Thanks, Mark, for sharing so much detail and helping people out there really understand how they can better protect themselves and how they can be aware of these attack techniques for more information visit the blog which will be linked in this podcast and thank you all for joining us today as always thanks to our super producer ben and the team who make this podcast happen i'm james maud and this has been a special episode of adventures of alice and bob